The bridge across the Lower Rhine at the Dutch town of Arnhem has a special place in World War II history. It was the focal point of a desperate battle in September 1944. The graves of over 1,400 Polish and British soldiers in war cemeteries around Arnhem stand as testament to the bitter struggle that took place here. They and others who fell into German hands were victims of a series of blunders. There were flaws in the operation's command and control and a disregard of vital intelligence information about the enemy. Plans misjudged the time required for ground forces to link up with the paratroopers who were dropped too far away from their critical objective, the bridge at Arnhem. When the Allies finally broke out of Normandy at the end of July 1944, they continued to advance across northern France. It seemed that the German armies in the west had been broken. Paris was liberated on August 25th. Residents celebrated the end of over four years of Nazi occupation. The Allied advance continued toward the Belgian and German borders. Meanwhile, on August 15, 1944, additional Allied forces landed in the south of France and began to head north. The Allies believed that they could end the war in Europe in 1944. But three weeks later, in early September 1944, a problem arose. In an attempt to slow the Allied advance, Hitler ordered that the French ports on the English Channel should be held to the bitter end. Not until September 12th did the Allies capture their first port, Le Havre. It took considerable time to return the docks to working order. Hitler's channel port policy meant that the Allies had to rely solely on the French port of Cherbourg. The result was that the further east the Allies advanced, the more tenuous their supply lines became. This triggered a bitter debate between the Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower and Bernard Montgomery, commander of the British and Canadian forces. Eisenhower wanted to advance on a broad front with Montgomery's 21st Army Group and Omar Bradley's U.S. 12th Army Group pushing side by side toward the German border. Montgomery cited the growing logistics problem and said that overstretched supply lines could not support both Army Groups. A streamlined supply system, the Red Ball Express, had been set up, but it was beginning to break down. It sent an endless conveyor belt of trucks speeding back and forth along ever longer routes between Cherbourg and the front. The snag was that the trucks burned more and more of the very fuel they were transporting. The result was that by the second week in September, both army groups had run out of fuel. Their advance had come to a virtual halt. This gave the German armies vital time to regroup. 
hopes that the war could be won before the end of 1944 began to evaporate. But Field Marshal Montgomery still felt the goal could be achieved. He saw the Rhine as the main obstacle to the Allies' advance into Germany. Montgomery believed this could be overcome by crossing the Lower Rhine in Holland. The route into the German heartland would be opened. But before the Germans realized what was happening, crossings over the Lower Rhine and the waterways to its south would have to be secured. The Allies had a force that could do this. The first Allied airborne army, commanded by the American general, Louis Brereton. Three of his unit's divisions, the British 6th and the American 82nd and the 101st Airborne units, had taken part in D-Day. Since then, the Airborne Army had not been used, although a number of operations had been planned and canceled. Now, the Airborne was given the chance to break the stalemate and play a key role in a decisive victory over Germany. General Eisenhower accepted Montgomery's plan for overcoming the deadlock and outflanking the Rhine. He ordered that it commence Sunday, September 17th, 1944. Montgomery's plan was codenamed Market Garden. The U.S. 101st Airborne Division was to secure bridges in Holland over two canals in the Eindhoven area. The 82nd Airborne Division was to capture the Grave Bridge over the Maas River and another at Nijmegen over the River Waal. Finally, the British 1st Airborne Division and the Polish Parachute Brigade were to secure the bridge over the Lower Rhine at Arnhem. Then, the Allied thrust into Germany could begin. General Frederick Browning was overall commander of the airborne operation. Known in the British Army as Boy Browning, he was married to the famous novelist Daphne de Maurier. General Brian Horrocks was one of Montgomery's principal lieutenants, commanding the British 30 Corps. He was in charge of the ground operation that would link up with the airborne divisions. The detailed planning of Market Garden contained a number of flaws that ultimately proved critical. They included command and control difficulties, disregard of vital intelligence, the distance between Arnhem's drop zone and the bridge, and the deployment of the airborne force to Arnhem, and the advance of the link-up force. Initially, Horrocks had no direct radio link with the airborne divisions. All messages between his men and the headquarters had to be transmitted via Browning, which meant delays in communicating vital information. Browning's headquarters was superfluous and should not have been deployed. Second, the Dutch resistance had reported that two crack SS Panzer divisions, the 9th Hohenstaufen and 10th Frunsberg, were re-equipping in the Arnhem area after their defeat in Normandy but Allied intelligence largely discounted the threat they posed to British and Polish paratroops. Both SS divisions were under-equipped, but they were still powerful and determined. They had also received training in anti-airborne operations. Their presence at Arnhem was a critical factor in ruining Allied hopes for victory before the end of 1944. Third, it was important to seize the bridge at Arnhem quickly to take advantage of the surprise airborne drop. The drop had to take place by day to ensure its accuracy. But the RAF feared that flak guns placed around the bridge would shoot down too many of its aircraft. 
Consequently, the drop zone was located in Wolfhase. This was eight miles from the bridge at Arnhem. Fourth, there were not enough airplanes to drop the Arnhem Division along with the Poles at the same time. The 1st Airborne Division would fly in two waves on day one, with a second wave on day two. The Poles followed on day three. This was a dangerous dissipation of force. The fifth and final planning blunder concerned the 30 Corps. Because the paratroopers were lightly equipped and would not survive long on their own, Horrocks was given three days to reach Arnhem. But much of his route used a single road, making his troops vulnerable to flank attacks. Allied High Command recognized none of these blunders. As American and British paratroopers boarded their transport aircraft and gliders on Sunday morning, September 17, 1944, they too were seemingly unaware of these problems. They thought they were about to strike the decisive blow in Western Europe. They had no idea the effect these planning blunders would have on Operation Market Garden, especially the grim week-long battle that would descend on the little Dutch town of Arnhem. On September 17, 1944, Allied airborne landings in Eindhoven, Nijmegen, and Arnhem took the Germans by surprise. The 101st Airborne, the Screaming Eagles, quickly captured three out of four bridges. The 82nd All-Americans were also successful, but could not capture the crucial Nijmegen Bridge. The initial landings outside Arnhem also went well. But when British paratroopers began to advance into Arnhem, they met heavy fire and had to fight their way forward. The SS Panzer divisions quickly recovered from their initial surprise. Even so, one British battalion did manage to reach the bridge over the Lower Rhine and capture its northern end. Meanwhile, British General Horrocks began his link-up operation, hoping to reach Eindhoven by nightfall. But his troops found themselves advancing up a single road, with the ground on either side too soft to support armored vehicles. German soldiers armed with anti-tank weapons quickly took advantage of this. The Germans slowed the advance. Soon there was a 30-mile backup of vehicles. The 30 Corps paid a penalty for this choice of route. The consequence was that by nightfall, the 30 Corps was still six miles short of Eindhoven. Its chances of reaching Arnhem in the proposed three days were looking dim. Not until the evening of September 18th did General Horrocks men link up with the 101st Airborne at Eindhoven. Further north, a battle group from the 10th SS Panzer Division was holding the bridge over the Val at Nijmegen, frustrating the 82nd Airborne. 
At Arnhem, the final brigade of the 1st Airborne Division landed at the Wurfhase drop zone on September 18th. These reinforcements were desperately needed. The battalion at the bridge was still isolated. But the new arrivals experienced fierce German resistance upon landing. House-to-house -house fighting was underway within Arnhem itself as the SS tried to undermine efforts to reinforce paratroopers at the bridge. On Tuesday the 19th, the Polish paratroop brigade was supposed to reinforce the troops at Arnhem. Fog prevented this. The British continued to cling to the northern end of the Arnhem Bridge, but most of the drop zones designated for supply drops had fallen into German hands. Attempts to have supplies dropped elsewhere failed because the paratroopers could not communicate with the aircraft with their radios. Another blunder. The battle for the Nijmegen Bridge continued. But the 30 Corps had now reinforced the American paratroopers there. The bridge was seized on the evening of the following day before the Germans could demolish it. The link-up forces were now just 11 miles from Arnhem. There was still hope that the link-up with the 1st Airborne Division would occur and the bridge at Arnhem would be secured. But British tanks were short on fuel. German attacks on the flanks of the 30 Corps delayed refueling efforts and slowed their progress. Not until the 21st, day five of Operation Market Garden, did the fog lift and the Polish Parachute Brigade deploy. But they landed on the south bank of the Lower Rhine. Although some men managed to cross the river, they could not link up with their British comrades. Within Arnhem, the British hold on the northern end of the bridge finally broke. The remnants of the 1st Airborne Division were driven back to the suburb of Osterbeck. The 30 Corps ultimately managed to reach the south bank of the Lower Rhine, but they were unable to cross it. Finally, on Sunday, September 24th, a decision was made to evacuate the 1st Airborne Division and the Poles. Of the 10,000 men who had dropped into Arnhem, just over 3,000 escaped. Almost 1,500 were killed. The remainder became German prisoners, defiant to the end. Arnhem was the bridge too far. The mission was hampered by cumbersome communications, insufficient appreciation of the German SS troops around Arnhem, and the location of the drop zone there, as well as the mistaken belief that General Horrocks could reach Arnhem in three days. The slow deployment of the airborne force to Arnhem did not help either. These blunders lost Montgomery his chance to finish the war by the end of 1944. The Allies were now faced with an even grimmer campaign as they struggled against both winter and the stiffening German resistance in their advance on the Rhine. They would not cross the Rhine until March of 1945.
Arnhem itself would not be liberated until April, seven months after the epic battle for its bridge. The people of Arnhem and the veterans who fought there over 50 years ago still remember their fallen comrades with pride. But at the same time... I think the higher-ups let us down. They let us down. The graves of the British and Polish soldiers who fought so gallantly but in vain are a somber reminder of Arnhem's costs. The soldiers' bravery and sacrifice could not compensate for the blunders. <laughs>